Good morning, everybody. It's Wednesday, April the 29th, and I hope you're doing well, staying safe and uh, healthy, and uh, continuing continuing to uh, practice your social distancing and and all of those things they're asking us to do. We're in a study on the uh, tabernacle, and uh, so we're going to continue that today, and uh, we're going to look at the uh, brass laver the uh, basin where the priests uh, wash their hands. So we'll be looking at that in just a minute. I was going to read you a couple of uh, introductory comments, just a, actually just one comment about the tabernacle. Uh, this person writes, the tabernacle was a simple but complex structure that foreshadowed Christ and the gospel from every angle and from every action associated with it. The tabernacle with its constituent parts was a picture prophecy that found fulfillment not only in the person and work of Christ but also in the benefits, blessings, and obligations attendant to and flowing from Him. The tabernacle with its rituals taught by object lesson how to worship the Holy God and how to experience the covenant promise of life and fellowship with God. Uh, that came from the book Beginning at Moses on page 274 by Michael Barrett. And uh, Anyway, awesome quote and statement about the tabernacle and how it applies to us today. I know there's some folks who've uh, never really studied the tabernacle and don't see the association with uh, how the tabernacle applies to us today, but I hope some of these lessons have been a blessing and just kind of uh, help you to understand how the tabernacle applies to us and how it is such a blessing to us as we study it. Well, so we're going to look at the, uh, today we're going to look at the brass labor um, which is the basin. Last week we looked at the brazen altar, and that was a picture of our salvation, how there had to be a sacrifice, a substitute, uh, really a savior in a sense for our sin. And uh, this week we're going to look at the, the laver, which is, uh, it was placed between the brazen altar and the tent. So it would be the brazen altar, then the laver, then the tent. And... Uh, so I'm going to read uh, a little bit about that to you. Uh, it's mentioned in Exodus chapter 30, verses 17 through 21, and then in one verse, uh, as far as its construction, in Exodus 38, 8. So uh, Exodus 30, verse 17, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Thou shalt also make a laver of brass, and his foot also of brass, to wash withal. And thou shalt put it between the tabernacle, and the congregation and the altar, and thou shalt put water therein. For Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet thereat. When they go into the tabernacle of a congregation, they shall wash with water, that they die not. And when they come near to the altar to minister to burn offering made by to burn offering made by fire unto the Lord, so shall they wash their hands and their feet, that they die not, and it shall be a statute forever, forever to them, even to him and to his seed throughout their generations. So there's the description of the construction. It doesn't really give you any dimensions of how big it was um, exactly, but it, say, it does say that there was a labor there, or a, our word would be lavatory, or a basin for, their, for them to wash their hands in. Let me give you, this is a Riken's commentary on Exodus. And uh, let me just read you a little introductory thought by him. He says, The basin was the last piece of furniture for the tabernacle. It went in the courtyard between the altar of sacrifice and the doorway to the tent of meeting. Like everything else in the courtyard, this labor was made of bronze. We're not certain what size or shape it was. Presumably, it was round and large enough to hold sufficient water for the priest to wash. One thing we know is that the bronze laver came in two parts. The basin itself was set on top of a stand or pedestal and then filled with water. This wash basin was in almost constant use. Before a priest went inside the tent of meeting to perform his sacred duties, he had to stop at the bronze basin. It was located in front of the tent to remind the priest to wash before entering. They washed their hands and their feet the body parts they used to serve God. The priest also had to wash up before they made any kind of sacrifice on the great bronze altar. As the priests came and went, they were always stopping at the basin for cleansing. 
he goes on to say down here and in, in later in the uh, on this page, he goes on to say, the priest had already received a once for all cleansing from sin at their ordination. Before they were ever allowed to set foot in the courtyard to the tabernacle, they were washed from head to toe. This was their baptism, their consecration to their priestly service of God. At their ordination, the priest also received atonement for their sins. Seven bulls were sacrificed to pay the debt they owed to God. So why did the priest need to keep washing? So I want to try to answer that question. Why did the priest need to keep washing at that laver there in the courtyard of the tabernacle? And uh, so, again, if you can picture it, it was just a basin full of, full of water where they would wash their hands and, and where they would take some of that water and wash their feet. So you might, again, you might ask the question, well, why did they have to do that? Well, I mean, I'm kind of simple in my thoughts, but they had to wash because they were dirty. And the reason they were dirty is because they had, as the priest role, they had been serving God. So they had been helping with the slaughter of the animals. There would have been blood. There would have been dirt on their feet. There was no floor to the tabernacle. Um, so they would have been uh, walking around in a dirty, uh, really a, a dirty earth, if you will. There was dirt everywhere. So the reason the priests had to use that labor is because they were dirty. And it is kind of symbolically a picture of you and I of how we um, get dirty as we go along in life. And dirty in the sense of being defiled by sin. So uh, one of the guys I was reading said this, even the best of God's children, in this case the priests, needed cleansing on a regular basis. In J. Vernon McGee's commentary, he has a little poem that goes like this. To dwell above with the saints of love, oh, that will be glory. But to stay below with the saints that I know, well, that's another story. Isn't that so true? And uh, he also goes on to say, McGee did in his commentary, one of the biggest troubles in the church today is that there's too much spiritual B.O., body odor. And, uh, you know, he's basically saying we need to be cleansed. So the idea here, guys and ladies, is that even though these priests were saved, they still sin, and they sin even in the service of God. By doing the things that they did regularly, they came in contact with things that defiled them. And uh, I just wrote down a couple of, well, I wrote down a verse here. Uh, Proverbs 24, 16, For a just man falls seven times and rises up again, but the wicked shall fall into mis mischief. The just man falls seven times. The word just there means righteous. And the picture is, is that even those that we would consider the best of us, we all sin. Uh, the reality is, saved people sin. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, people may sin accidentally. They may say, they may sin incidentally, but a lot of times people sin purposely. They say things they know they shouldn't say. They dwell on things they know they shouldn't dwell on. They do things they know they shouldn't do. That labor is a picture that believers need to be cleansed because they're dirty. Now, I got saved back in 1987 when I was 23. But since then, I've sinned, and I've sinned a lot since then. And uh, Romans 7, verse 15 says this, as Paul wrote, he says, For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. Isn't that sobering to realize that the things that he hated, there were things that he, he, he didn't want to do, but he did. And so to answer that question, why would the priest need to wash at that labor? Well, they were dirty. That's why. Um, David wrote in Psalm 51 too, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me 
from my sin. 2 Corinthians 7, 1 says, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Now, I'm not excusing it or condoning it or overlooking it, but the fact is, the reality is, and don't let anybody tell you differently, I don't care what denomination they are, we sin. And we sin typically on a daily basis. And because of that, we need to be cleansed. So the reason they washed, they were dirty. Secondly, it was a necessity. If I were to go back and read, let me just read you this in verse... Uh, Oh, uh, verse 20 of Exodus chapter 30, it says, When they go into the tabernacle of the congregation, they shall wash with water that they die not. If they went into that tent of meeting without washing beforehand, they died. They didn't make it. So, uh, I mean, it was a matter of life and death for them to be cleansed. And I kind of, I was thinking about that in our, our uh, situation today as believers, if we kind of if we uh, if we compare that to our lives today, they couldn't serve unless they were cleansed. And the fact is, we today can't serve powerfully, appropriately, without being cleansed. God wants us to be pure vessels. He wants us to be uh, changed and transformed. He wants us to be cleansed. And he repeatedly talks about that, if you will, in the New Testament. But it was an absolutely necessity to them. It wasn't optional for them. They had to be cleansed before they served. Even before they offered anything on the altar, they had to be cleansed. So why did they have to, the priest have to cleanse himself at the labor? Well, it was a necessity. They were dirty, but it was a necessity to be able to serve God as they went inside and they had the, there was the table of the show showbread and the altar of incense and the uh, and the lamp they had to serve God they had to be cleansed before they could serve God and uh, so the picture there is is that you and I if we want to serve God acceptably like it speaks of in Hebrews we need to be cleansed thirdly as we look at that laver, it's interesting. It was a brass laver. Now, I said there was another verse, and there is a verse in Exodus 38. And let me read it to you. I believe it's verse 8. Yeah. And he made the laver of brass and the foot of it of brass and the looking glasses of the women assembling, which assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Now, that's interesting. It says, the looking glasses of the women. What that means is the women brought their polished brass to those men who constructed the labor. The polished brass, when it says looking glasses, it was a mirror. Now, of course, it wouldn't be like a mirror today, but it was a mirror that they looked in to find their uh, impurities, their defects. And isn't it interesting that that labor where they washed, it had water in it, which would have been clear, and that brass was, was like a mirror. You know, the Bible is likened to a mirror in James chapter 1. It says, Whoso looks into the perfect law of liberty uh, and continues therein, his work shall be blessed. Um, well, here it is. But whoso looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues therein, he being not a forgetful here, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed of his deeds. So the idea here, guys and ladies, is that this labor is a picture, if you will, symbolically of God's Word. So, you might say, well, why do we have to wash? We get dirty in this old world. John chapter 13, remember that story? Peter, uh, the, the Lord was washing the disciples' feet, and, and Peter said, Lord, wash my head and my whole body, and he said, no, you've already been washed. You've already been bathed all over. You just need your, your feet washed which means we get dirty in this world. I mean, you can't hardly turn on that television without seeing something that you, uh, you shouldn't have seen or you don't want to see. And, uh, but anyway, we get dirty. You get dirty just, uh, just rubbing shoulders in this world. And so the idea is why, well, we answer that, we get dirty. 
And the, uh, the second idea is how does this labor cleanse them? Well, symbolically, that's a picture of God's Word. In John 17, 17, it says, Sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. You know, the word sanctify just means to, to set them apart, make them holy, in a sense. And uh, in John 15, 3, it says that we are clean by the word or through the word. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. So that labor symbolically pictures God's Word of how God's Word cleanses us as we wash our life and our mind in God's Word. So I just want to encourage you um, a couple of things. Don't forget, we all need to confess our sins to the Lord, uh, even after we're saved. Isaiah 59.1 says, uh, the Lord's hand is not short that it cannot save, neither is ear heavy that it cannot hear, but your sins, your iniquities have separated you from Him. And so that sin divides us. It doesn't break our relationship with God, but it, but it impacts our fellowship with God. And we need to make those accounts right. Uh, so anyway, I would just encourage you, uh, be one of those people that is sensitive to your own sin and confess it. Uh, as you sin throughout the day, you need to confess those sins. But remember how God cleanses us and how He enables us to not sin is through His Word. You remember that old saying, uh, sin will keep you from this book, or this book will keep you from sin. So I remember years ago, I was at a, at, at a conference up at the Wilds, and one of the preachers, I won't tell you who it was, but I remember who it was. Anyway, he had been doing some counseling with somebody, and he used this little illustration. He said, you know, if, if somebody was, was sick, with a headache, you would um, prescribe them or the doctor would say, take a couple of aspirins. Okay. But if that same person came to you and said that they had cancer, the doctor's not going to prescribe them a couple of aspirins. He's going to go through some kind of protocol of chemotherapy that hammers that cancer and roots it out. And it's going to be, it's going to be more thorough. It's going to be more heavy. It's, there's just going to be a lot more of it. And he applied that by saying this. In your life, if you're struggling with a sin, he said, reading a couple of verses in the morning is not going to typically help you to overcome that. You need to begin hammering that sin with God's Word, taking large doses of this Bible to help you to overcome that. So I just want to encourage you. You know, I've been plowing out in the garden some with Tammy, and she does a really good uh, job. I walk behind her and watch her. <laughs> Not really. I do. I do the plowing, but but anyway, she uh, my feet will get all get dirty. And uh, I we were talking yesterday. We were down there yesterday afternoon. I was talking how how good it feels for the dirt to to for you to walk in that fresh dirt, you know, between your toes and all this stuff. But inevitably, your feet get all muddy and dirty. So anyway, I had to come up to the to the faucet up here uh, by the house, the outside faucet, and wash my feet off. And it took a lot of water. And you know, in our lives, there's some things that are going on that we need to apply a lot of God's Word to our heart to get, it, to get that cleansed, to help us to have the strength not to do that anymore. That brass laver was there because they were dirty. It was a necessity, but it symbolically pictures how God's Word can cleanse us. You know, I don't know what's going on in your, in your life today. But I know this. The Bible says if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And maybe you're struggling with something. Maybe you feel guilty. Maybe you feel dirty. Maybe you feel bad. Why don't you just bow your heart and ask the Lord to forgive you? Restore that fellowship with Him so you can have that power to live for Him, to love Him, and to serve Him. Well, there's a little picture of the brass labor. I hope it's been a blessing to you. We'll continue next week as we move inside uh, the uh, tabernacle. Let's bow together. Father, we do thank you for another day. Praise you for your goodness. Bless our time together. I pray you be with all the folks that watch this. And Lord, just use it for your glory in Jesus' name.